Hello everyone, uh, today we're going to be talking about cutting tool materials. Uh, so what you'll find when you start machining is that uh, cutting tool choice is about the most important choice you can make uh, when it comes to how fast you can make a part, what kind of materials you can machine, the rate at which you can machine them. Uh, it's, it's a huge industry as you can see from, from the numbers here and cutting tools can actually get quite expensive, uh, especially if you're breaking them. Uh, so why? Why is this a big deal? Because uh, huge stress, right? We talked about forces last time, uh, but there's lots of force on the cutting tool. Uh, there's lots of friction, which produces heat, and uh, heat is one of the killers, uh, one of the big killers of tooling. Uh, so we're really looking at materials that are strong, but also can stand up to high temperatures. Uh, so we need hard tools uh, in order to uh, resist the, the stress from cutting, we need materials that, that won't fail. We don't we want materials that don't uh, elastically deform, which lose their geometry, or plastically deform and, and permanently yield and change their shape and don't are become less sharp. Um, we need materials that are resistant to abrasion, uh, resistant to wearing, also resistant to chipping. We want tough materials, so toughness and strength are different things. Uh, strength which is related back to hardness. Uh, strength is, you know, the harder something is, usually the stronger it is, which means that the yield strength is, is higher. So for metals, uh, as our steel, let's take a, a hardening steel. As I harden it, uh, the hardness goes up, the strength goes up, but the toughness, which is the resistance to uh, impact, goes down. So usually the harder something gets, the more brittle it gets, the less the lower the toughness, the more susceptible it is to uh, breaking under impact or cracking and fatigue failure. Uh, hot hardness. So these materials are going to get hot, so they need to keep their strength as they heat up. Uh, resistant to bulk deformation. You know, we, we don't want our tool geometry to change as we load uh, from the stress from cutting. Uh, chemical stability, so it doesn't react and get weaker through chemical reactions. Uh, adequate thermal properties, uh, coefficient of thermal expansion, things like that. Uh, high stiffness, uh, gets back into the resisting deformation. Uh, tool life, we want tools to be consistent so that we, we can estimate how long a tool is going to last before it needs to be replaced. Uh, we need to be able to get the correct geometry on it and the correct surface finish for machining. It's got to be something we can, it can't be such a ridiculously strong material that we can't actually shape it into a cutter. Uh, so what materials do you see? Uh, most commonly you see high speed steel, uh, especially if you're making a part here or there on a mill or a lathe. You're probably going to use some kind of high speed steel tooling at least initially. Uh, after that you see some cobalt alloys. Uh, which isn't listed here, we'll talk about later on. Uh, you see tungsten carbide, which if you ever hear about carbide tooling, it's, it's usually tungsten carbide. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. And these are other things are mainly coating materials, uh, so titanium carbide, titanium nitride, aluminum oxide, uh, carbonitride, silicon nitride, polycrystal diamond, uh, CBN, cubic boron nitride. You usually see those more as coatings. But uh, mainly the actual base material of tooling is usually high-speed steel uh, or tungsten carbide with a few exceptions. Uh, so here's a chart that shows uh, material hardness versus temperature. Uh, so in all these materials, as they heat up, they lose their hardness, which means they also lose their strength. Uh, so we start with high-speed steels, this little contour here. Uh, versus carbon tool steels. So the main difference between a high speed steel and a high carbon tool steel is uh, high speed steels retain more of their strength as they get warmer. So that's why we don't machine with tool steels. As tool steels, uh, we mainly need the strength and the hardness, uh, but we don't really need the temperature resistance. Whereas with tool steels, they're gonna get hot. So, you know, over a thousand degrees potentially. So uh, we need, we need to materials that hold their strength as they get warmer. Uh, carbides appear somewhere between a metal and a ceramic. Uh, they have a higher hardness and they keep their hardness as they get, get hot. Uh, and then we have full on ceramics. Ooh, that's a bad squeak. Uh, ceramics and uh, cermets way, way up here. But all these things suffer as they get hotter. Some just suffer less than others. So tool steel, again, we don't really machine much with tool steel. Uh, these are all say high-speed steel. They're not tool steel. Tool steel and high-speed steel are different things. 
Uh, so you know, tool steel, we're not, we don't use the machining very much because it, it starts to get soft around 400 degrees and that just isn't, isn't good for machining. High speed steel, again, it's about 100 years old. It's got special alloying it, elements in it uh, that keep its hardness up to around 1100 degrees, which makes it suitable for, for machining. Uh, so two to three times cutting speed of tool steel uh, with equal tool life. So uh, here's a few grades of high-speed steels and their chemical compositions. You can see their carbon con content somewhere in the, it'd be in the high carbon range. I mean, uh, we're talking like a 1080 or 1065 to 1080 would be around that. We're, we've got, you know, 1% carbon here and uh, some of these M grade high-speed steels. A lot of carbon, which allows them to be very, very hard, which we, we, need, we need hardness because we need strength for cutting. Uh, a few percent chromium. Uh, this, these have quite a lot of molybdenum in it. Uh, some tungsten in here too. Quite a lot of tungsten actually. Uh, vanadium, cobalt, manganese, silicone. A few different compositions here. Uh, again, these are mainly we need the carbon, which gives us the strength, and uh, we need these other alloying elements that that make it resistant to temperature and also help with the strength and grain structure too. Uh, so, uh, this is still a steel, so we can make it the same way we make other steel things. We can forge them, we can cast them. Uh, hot isostatic pressing, I'm not familiar with at all, but you can Google that one, that might be interesting. Uh, so, lots of things are made out of high-speed steel. Files, saw blades, drill bits, taps, uh, mill cutters, brooches, uh, turning tools sometimes will be made out of, of high-speed steel. Pretty common, uh, you'll grind a, one... Uh, Sorry, I guess you're not going to grind one for your clocks. Sorry, um, but you get a little block, little rectangular shape of tool steel, and you use a grinder and grind it into uh, the shape of a of a cutter by removing a bit of material. You can get the shape of a, a get a cutting edge that you can use to to machine with. Um, you know, a lot, a lot of drill bits are high speed steel. A lot of mills and mills are high speed steel. Uh, it's pretty common. You hear about cobalt, cobalt tooling, cobalt alloys. Uh, they've got more cobalt than a high-speed steel would have. You can get back to this chart here, and you can see these. These some of these have quite a bit of cobalt in them. Uh, uh, these you get a little bit harder. Rockwell C60 to 65. That's getting getting pretty hard. Uh, and high temperature resistance. The cobalt tooling is a little more expensive. It's like like an upgraded high-speed steel essentially. Uh, carbides, uh, so the group popularity in World War II, so we're talking 70-ish years. Um, these are powder made by powder metallurgy, so essentially it's, it's little bitty chunks of very hard material, a carbide in this case, tungsten carbide, and they're bound together with, ah, what, why did it do that? They're bound together, I lost my great diagram, uh, these little chunks of tungsten carbide are bound together by a metal matrix. Uh, no, there's my bad diagram. So these little chunks of the material is, why is it doing this to me? These little chunks of uh, the actual hard thing that's doing the machining are held together in a metal metal matrix. Um, so these are going to be made like all powder metallurgy things where you mix a blend of different pellets together, different little particles together. You press them together into a green shape and then you bake to fuse the, the matrix together uh, and then they have to be honed into shape. Some might not, some, some will have to be have a, a, some kind of a machining process at the end to get them in shape. Which of course you have to machine it with something harder than it's made out of. So uh, you know when you're talking about carbides you, you need some pretty pretty beefy materials to be able to machine this. Uh, so tungsten carbide is pretty well the, the most common one. There's other ones, tungsten titanium carbide, tungsten titanium tantalum carbide, uh, some other fancy ones, but tungsten carbide is, is usually the most the most common one, and it'll be a cobalt binder. It'll usually be the matrix in it. Uh, around twice the hardness of high-speed steel. Uh, Excellent resistant to abrasion. That, that's good. Uh, it doesn't abrade, doesn't wear as fast as, as high-speed steel. High modulus elast elasticity, so it's very stiff. It doesn't change geometry, which helps hit tolerances. Uh, it's chemically inert, uh, at least to the kind of things we see in, in machining. So uh, it's not going to react with anything like like you know iron, steel alloys. They're they're going to rust. They're going to react with things. They're going to oxidize and might cause problems. 
Uh, the tension strength, since the hardness is roughly twice that of high speed steel, the tension, the yield strength is twice of high speed steel. Uh, good compressive strength too because of the matrix. Uh, and again, most things like this are gonna be better in compression than tension, but because of the, the metal matrix, it, it has a high tension strength too, as opposed to a pure ceramic that would not have a high tension strength. Uh, shouldn't say tough and toughness is really one of the the weaknesses of carbides um, because they're they are harder than steel they're more brittle brittle than steel and they're more likely to impact than a high speed steel tool so this this really isn't an advantage compared to high speed steel now these are i don't want to say better all around but uh and, and there's a lot of situations where you want to be using carbide and the only reason you don't is because they're expensive the downside usually on carbide is uh you'll break them you'll you'll break if you do you have your speeds and feeds set up wrong uh, and overstress the tool, it'll, it'll just snap. Uh, it, you might snap the cutting edge, break the cutting edge off, or dull the tool by breaking off a little piece. At high speed steel, you usually w wear the cutting edge down and it becomes less sharp. In carbide, you usually break the cutting edge off and then it becomes much less sharp and then bad things happen and it breaks. Uh, you can push these harder since it's a harder material, stronger material, you can push at higher cutting speeds than, than high speed steel. Uh, it's just usually when they when they go, they go. As opposed to high speed steel, it starts to dull, the performance goes down, you put a new tool in or sharpen it. Uh, this, when it starts to go, it just the tool just breaks. Uh, this is used a lot in inserted tooling, especially in turning, but also in milling applications too, uh, where you have a tool holder that'll be tool steel. So you'll have a holder that'll be made out of tool steel, and then you'll put a little cutting edge on it that will be that's terrible drawing but this would be the holder that you'd put in uh, that you'd hooked up to like on a uh, on a lathe you'd have this hooked up to your tool post holder this would be hooked to your tool post and then you have a little insert that's held in with a screw here that's made out of tungsten carbide uh, or some some other carbide that'll be coated with something and your actual cutting edge is really really hard good hard material but there's not a lot of it so it's relatively cheap and then the bulk of your material is actually high speed steel or tool steel out here and that, that part you never have to change, you just change inserts. Like pretty well all the turning I do, I like doing with inserted tooling. If, if it's an option to use inserted tooling, it's usually worth it. You have high initial cost for all of your tool holding pieces, but once you've bought all those, you're just buying inserts. And uh, honestly, the inserts, they can be expensive, but there's also some cheap options for inserts nowadays that, that work pretty well. Uh, coated carbides, almost all of your carbide tooling is going to be coated with something, 85 to 90% here, but the vast majority of, of carbide is coated with something. Uh, like it can be nitrided, it can be uh, titanium nitride, silicon nitride, it can be um, uh, titanium carbonitride, or all sorts of nice fancy coatings, but it's almost always coated some amount. Uh, it can prove tool life two to three times. It just makes the outer layer of the tool that much harder, that much more wear resistant, so it lasts longer, it stays sharper. Uh, and these are usually, this coating's applied with a chemical vapor deposition, pretty thin layer, we're talking you know, tenths of a thousandths of an inch. Uh, shapes of tooling, shapes of inserts mainly, square inserts, a diamond inserts are really common, triangle's pretty common, square to some extent, but these two are pretty common. Round, you see a little bit turning applications. Two, you get different surface finishes with, with each of these. So here's some coated carbide inserts uh, for milling. Uh, so here is a, an inserted end mill. So instead of a regular fluted end mill, uh, we've got little bitty cutting inserts here. We've got three of them in this case. Those would be tungsten carbide. Uh, the gold coating is usually titanium nitride. That's, that's usually what that means. Not always, but uh, uh, most of the titanium nitrides, look, they look this, this yellow color. Uh, so the underlying material, the actual cutting, the, the, the bulk of the cutting insert would be tungsten carbide and then be, be coated with uh, titanium nitride. Secured with a little torque screw, that's pretty common. Uh, and then this will be some kind of beefy steel, uh, tool steel or a, hard, a high speed steel, something like that. And then you, you buy this and you should never break that. You, you can, it's usually pretty traumatic when you do. Uh, but you shouldn't break that. You just break inserts and replace those. Since they are tungsten carbide, the inserts, uh, when they break, they usually just chip. And then once they chip, then, then you have to replace them. Uh, 
you can wear them if you set everything right and you don't abuse your tooling you can eventually wear these down so their geometry they're not sharp anymore and they don't cut as well but in my experience making one-off parts on things you, you usually just break these things by doing something stupid and uh, replace them uh, in a more of mass production environment you might actually have everything set up right and not encounter anything strange and actually wear these inserts down uh, some of them you can flip them looks like these you can flip 180 degrees and you get two cutting edges per insert uh, looks like these you might have four cutting edges per insert you can see this this face mill here uh, having used a fly cutter or a, uh, a tool steel or high-speed steel face cut mill uh, these inserted face mills are they're basically magic and you make chips rain on these things they they will eat through metal very quickly same with these inserted end mills so again if if you have the option and you have the money uh, it's really really there's no excuse for for not using inserted tooling it, it just it works so much better and for most applications uh, for turning this would be a, a external turning uh, bar for a lathe so you put this in a tool post and then you just be your cutting insert over here uh, those are handy I pretty well I don't turn with high speed steel at all I, unless I absolutely have to so uh, if you're going to replace all of your tooling on your mill or your lathe with inserts you go with the lathe first because it makes such a huge difference uh, here's an inserted boring bar and the tooling is expensive you know each, each one of these holders is quite expensive you might pay a hundred to a few hundred dollars uh, for the tool holder itself and you might pay a buck or two per insert uh, but that compares to maybe ten fifteen dollars or more for an end mill so uh, it, it ends up being more economical in the long run and it works better too so you, you see this a lot in most shops uh, you, know, you can even take a, a hundred year old crappy lathe and put a proper tool post and use inserted tooling on it and as long as the machine's got good tolerances still it, it, it'll make good parts and still be useful uh, coated carbide, again, it's a pretty thin layer. Uh, titanium nitride is really common. Uh, and again, that's usually the gold surface finish. Uh, titanium carbonitride is also common. That's kind of a different color. Those are usually kind of a grayish finish, if I remember correctly. Uh, you can see there'll be tungsten carbide core uh, and then some different plating materials on it. So in this case, it's got a titanium carbide layer, an aluminum oxide, and then a titanium nitride layer here so uh, there's a lot of of science in these inserts uh, and best recommendation on inserts is most manufacturers will have a catalog Kenna metals a big manufacturer of tooling so Kenna metal uh, and you can find their catalog or the tooling manufacturing catalogs and you basically just look through what you're machining and how fast you want to machine it uh, and it'll make recommendations on on inserts it gets very complicated very quickly uh, coating, it's vapor deposition, so you have your thing you want to coat. Uh, you vaporize the coating material. You might have a reactive gas or a neutral gas or some mix going in, uh, and or in a, maybe in a vacuum too. Uh, but you basically vaporize the material you want to deposit, and you make a vapor. The vapor gets uh, electrostatically pulled to the substrate material. Uh, and, and plate it on top of it. Uh, again, these pretty thin. We're talking tenths of a thousandths of an inch. Uh, reduces tool wear, increases tool life, makes things better, doesn't cost that much more. So uh, you almost always want some some kind of a coating on on your car, uh, carbide tooling. In fact, almost all. I don't know if I used an uncoated tool at, at any point in time. Even just general carbide end mills will usually be nitrided. On, on the outside you can actually see if you find a carbide end mill uh, you'll see a line so you get like an end mill here there'll be some kind of a line where the color subtly changes this would be where the, the flutes would be up here and then this would be the the shank here uh, you'll see some kind of a line where the color changes and that, that's where it's been nitrided above that uh, another little hint on carbide so if you uh, buy tooling in an auction or something like that or if you're looking through a drawer in a shop trying to identify carbide tooling tungsten carbide is significantly denser than steel uh, and the the tooling will be significantly heavier than a uh, high-speed steel tooling uh, it'll usually be a little bit darker gray color uh, but the density is the main main way you can you can tell uh, ceramic tooling so things like aluminum oxide or silicon nitride uh, it gets harder to make these into actual tool shapes uh, so you're still talking about powder, powder, metrol, uh, yeah, powder metallurgy. 
metrology is a different thing. Powder metallurgy. Uh, yeah, hard, right? Ceramics are hard, which means they're going to be strong, uh, chemically inert, higher heat tolerance. Uh, but they're harder, so it means they're more brittle, which means they're less tough, which means they're more likely to break. So uh, they're not going to be used for real aggressive operations. It would be uh, used mainly for uh, gently machining very hard things like super alloys, like nickel-based super alloys uh, or some really high-strength steels. But you got to be careful how, how hard you push or you'll break your tooling. Uh, not suitable for aluminum or titanium. not exactly sure why. Uh, maybe it will be just not economical. Uh, but in titanium is just a pain to machine in general. I don't have a lot of experience with titanium, but uh, uh, it's uh, it's its whole thing is the, the, the machining titanium. Aluminum is really pretty easy to machine in most cases, so you really don't need anything too fancy for machining aluminum. Cermets uh, be a composite of a ceramic and a metal binder. Uh, so you know, it, it's a composite material. You sort of get the best of both both worlds. You get hard, little bitty cutting edges that are bound together with the metal, so it makes the tool tougher. Diamonds, polycrystal diamond, uh, basically little bitty tiny, tiny diamonds that are uh, on a carbide substrate. Uh, I'm not sure why it's not used with metals. There might be some chemical reaction or ferrous metals like iron. I'm not sure if there's a reaction there. I don't actually know. Uh, so you know, this would be for machining uh, non-ferrous metals. I've not actually ever encountered any polycrystal diamond tooling, so I don't have any personal experience to share on that. I mean, honestly, most everything I machine, most everything most people end up machining, unless you get to specialty applications. Uh, you use some high-speed steel end mills. Uh, you use carbide quite a lot in milling. When it comes to turning, you almost always use carbide inserts with different coatings on them. Uh, and you know you start getting into fancier tooling. You really need to be in a special application. In that in that case, you're you're going to have to to do a lot of research and and what the optimal tooling is in those niche applications. But for general milling and turning of of common aluminum and steel things like that, you really need high speed steel tooling for some end mills and, and carbide for for some milling and most of your turning operations. Uh, again, all this diamond thing, chemical vapor deposition is how you how you'd coat things with these little bitty diamonds. Uh, you can get thinner or thicker coating. It's pretty rare. It's not something you see that much. Uh, cubic boron nitride. Uh, CBN is, uh, I can't remember where it's at on the Mohs scale. It's really close to diamond, though. Uh, you see some coatings that are CBN. Uh, you know, pr pretty rare. You're getting into really expensive inserts for cutting really expensive materials in your ink and L's and other really hard to machine super alloys. Again, these are expensive materials. The tooling is going to be really expensive too. Uh, and it's going to be pretty rare to see to see the the CBN and the diamond tooling. Uh, here's a table from the book that goes into. Uh, it's a good good chart here for practical machining. You got your speed, surface feed, surface speed, and you've got your inch per revolution uh, feed rate. So uh, note that there's no there's no dominant material that's like it's really good at speed and it's really good at cutting cutting deep. And you can see there's a there's a a frontier here, which happens a lot in engineering. Uh, you can see your high speed steels down here. Uh, you're, you're not cutting very fast because if you start getting fast they get hot and they get dull and then they get even hotter and then bad things start to happen. Uh, so you can take pretty aggressive cuts uh, because these materials are tough and they're not, they're not, you're not just going to snap the cutting edge off because the toughness is there, the impact resistance is there. So you can be more aggressive with your cutting um, but you just can't cut very, very fast your surface speed has to be low to keep the heat generation down and then you got your tungsten carbides that you know you have to be a little more gentle with your passes but you can cut faster uh coated carbides uh cermets ceramics and then you get your polycrystal diamond or cbn tooling or your surface speeds have to be really high uh, i mean we're talking 10 times like you know here in two or three hundred surface feet per minute for machining uh, aluminum is pretty common without coolant and you're pushing 10 times that speed so what that means on a lathe or a mill you need 10 times the rpm uh, so you're talking mainly you know 20 30 thousand rpm something like that on some milling operations and you're way outside the the off spindle rpm on a lot of machines so uh, there's a balance in the machine you have the material you're cutting 
uh, the tooling you can afford. Uh, there's usually, again, so you, here you're talking about some specialty operations and maybe some, some high-speed machining, uh, but it, it's, it's a balance between how aggressive you, you can take a cut and how fast you can machine. There's going to be a sweet spot somewhere in here for whatever operation you're, you're working on. And it, usually that sweet spot somewhere in here for most all applications where, uh, you know, you probably need to be using high speed steel tooling or maybe some carbide. Uh, if you're turning, it's going to be more in this range, um, uh, in there. So milling, you're more in this world, turning you're in this world for general, general type stuff. You know, for those of you on design teams and making, uh, you know, one-off parts, things like that, you're, you're more in this, this world. Uh, you know, high-speed manufacturing of aerospace materials, you might start to get into this world up, up here. Uh, so, new demands in machining. Uh, more rigid tools. I mean, that's always a demand. That's one of the things you'll find when you machine is uh, your tooling. So, when you talk about aspect ratio, so if I have an end mill, I usually don't want that end mill to be more than about three times longer than the width. Uh, when I start pushing past that, you start getting into big deflection problems. And when the tool deflects, you lose your accuracy. It starts to chatter. It has uneven cutting. It's going to wear faster, and it's going to break sooner and wear out sooner. So uh, somewhere around that 3 to 1 aspect ratio is the sweet spot. That's true of like a boring bar and a lathe too, which you're usually way past that. So if you've got a boring bar that's pretty long and it's hooked up to your tool post and you've got your little insert out here, when you try to bore a hole with that thing, it's it's going to deflect and that's going to kill your accuracy. And, uh, and you're going to have discontinuous cutting potentially and all sorts of other issues that, that become problematic. So you, you want more rigid tooling and usually you're constrained like in boring you're constrained by actually getting this thing into the bore of whatever it is you're trying to machine uh, and you, you need to bore a hole so deep and a hole so big and you know you got to use the boring bar that fits in there uh, but if you can make that boring bar stiffer then you would get rid of the deflection and it would work better so always more rigid tooling is you want your tool to be infinitely rigid if you can but I mean, obviously it's a compromise because nothing is but uh, usually the more rigid the tooling the better uh, gentle entry and exit. That's important. Uh, usually, uh, you know, it's when the, when the first cutting edge encounters material, it's a big impact there. And that's where that's really going to break and stress the, those high, high hardness, low toughness materials. Uh, it's that, that shock of the, the tool edge first encountering the material. So if you can make that as gentle as possible in the exit too, uh, you can prevent damage to tooling, the, the hard, brittle tooling. Uh, precision is going to be better. It's going to be smoother. It's going to be more precise. You can control entry and exit better. You can control your speeds and feeds better. Uh, tools aren't going to be wandering around as much. Uh, higher power, higher spindle speeds. You know, for more spindle speed, you're going to need more power. So, uh, and the machines start to get more and more expensive. You know, the the this here, the entry and exit. That's all software in your cam software. Uh, Rigid tooling, there's also only so much you can do in that because you're talking about, uh, you know, basically getting back to Young's modulus on all this, and there's only so much you can do to, to affect that. And for steels, you, you can't do hardly anything to affect it. Um, precision, it's going to cost a lot of money. Power and spindle speed is going to cost you a lot of money. So uh, honestly, a lot of this when it comes to CNC machining, once you bought your machine, is doing a good job with your tool paths and having good cam software in the first place. Uh, wear. So uh, this diagram shows a diff few different kinds of wear on a tool. Uh, you can see this, the material has actually just been worn away on the cutting edge. Uh, you usually see more of this on high-speed steel tooling. Uh, again, carbide, usually you end up chipping it or breaking it or cracking it before you wear it. Again, your, your speeds and feeds have to be about perfect, and you've got to be doing something very repetitive where you're not introducing the tooling to, to new environments or new new materials or new new types of cuts. You know, if you're mass producing something and milling it with a carbide tool, if you got everything right, you might actually wear the carbide and that be the failure mode. Of it. In high speed steel, though, you usually end up wearing the tooling and have to have to sharpen it. Which for turning inserts or turning tools uh, with high speed steel, you can usually grind them into shape. Um, end mills, the problem with grinding an end mill, you can do it, but it makes the end mill smaller, and so you have to grind it precisely, measure the new dimension, and, and offset by that accordingly. Uh, different modes of tool wear, flank wear, 
Uh, again, just, just the erosion of the cutting edge. Uh, you know, here's some grooving, four and five, uh, chipping. You see some little chips form, partial fractures. You see that on carbide tooling quite a lot. The harder the tool, the more likely it is to fracture. Cratering, no, I've not seen that a lot. Uh, deformation, you see that on softer materials like high-speed steel. You know, the carbide's not, it's not going to deform, it's going to crack and break. Uh, thermal cracking, you might see, you know, from the harder materials and going through heat cycles. Built-up edge, you usually see from machining softer materials like aluminum. will leave a built-up edge on a carbide insert pretty fast and turning if you don't watch it. Uh, so criteria for tool life, high-speed steel, you know, you lose usually scrap a tool when you've lost about 1.5 millimeter, a high-speed steel tool, you might scrap it after you've lost three quarters of a millimeter. So this would be 60 thousandths, this would be 30 thousandths. Uh, carbide, you're talking about 20 thousandths of wear, ceramic, maybe 0.6, about 20, 30, 20, 25 thousandths or so of, of wear. Again, usually on these, you chip them. And that's that's when you're done. Uh, you know, unless you're doing mass production and everything's right, you, you're probably going to end up breaking these things, breaking off the cutting edge uh, before before you actually wear these. Uh, tool life is a prediction for tool life, uh, where you've got cutting speed, tool life in minutes, an exponent, and that's going to be a constant. So you can rearrange this equation for tool life if you know the cutting speed. Uh, the exponent n, which is uh, cutting tool dependent, and this constant c here. So uh, the different values of that exponent for different materials. Uh, High-speed steels, the exponent looks like this. Uh, uncoated carbides, titanium carbide, polydiamond, titanium nitride, ceramic coated inserts. Uh, so when you plot this, uh, you see for like a low carbon steel here, uh, you know, if you're at 300 feet per minute, the tool lasts a minute. If you decrease just slightly down here, it's going to last 100 minutes. So uh, what you'll find from this is uh, if you increase cutting speed a little bit, it greatly decreases cutting tool life. Uh, so there's, there's going to be a sweet spot somewhere in there where uh, you're, you cut fast, but your tool also lasts long enough. That, that you don't spend all your time swapping swapping tools out. So there's usually a balance. Uh, there's going to be a limit too on how fast you can cut before you damage. Just just chip the tool and damage it, and it doesn't last any any time at all. So uh, there, there's a limit to how fast you can push things. Uh, it depends on whether you're using coolant or not. That's a big big issue too. Uh, machinability of different materials, uh, different. Materials, different metals, even even especially, uh, machine very differently. Uh, material properties matter. You know, strength, toughness, those things matter. Uh, tool life can change a lot on material. Cutting speed uh, changes a lot on material. A lot of different ways of measuring that. Uh, but you know, this is a good quote here. The larger the shear stress or specific power value, the the, the harder it's going to be to machine in in general. So, uh, and that shouldn't be anything to, you know, that, that's pretty obvious, right? The stronger the material, the harder it's going to be to shear, because we're talking about shearing operations, uh, the, the harder it's going to be to machine. So it's, it's usually going to be harder to machine steels than aluminums, because it, it's harder to, steels in general are stronger than aluminum, so it, that's going to be harder to machine steels. Uh, there's some other things like uh, work hardening materials, or certain kinds of stainless steel that have complete crap yield strength, like 30 or 40 KSI yield strength, which is worse than 60, 61 aluminum, that are a nightmare to machine because they work hard. And, and as you machine, the material gets tougher, and it, gets, it doesn't get tougher, it gets harder, and it gets stronger, and it takes more, more energy and more effort and more stress to machine. And, uh, you know, some, some really crappy stainless alloys are remarkably hard to machine. Cast irons that have really crappy yield strengths might be really hard to machine because of uh, the little pockets of hard hard uh, uh, graphite uh, platelets that are that are in it. Uh, coolant, uh, cutting fluid, uh, so it does lots of things. Uh, it gets rid of heat, right? If that's if heat is the dominant thing that's killing your tooling. Uh, coolant can help a lot. Uh, so just in, for aluminum, I know you usually can run about twice the surface speed 
uh, with coolant as without coolant. So you might be running 400 surface feet per minute as opposed to 200 with coolant. Uh, lubrication too, right? They're usually oil based of some kind. Uh, and also flushes chips away, which can be really big and, and when you're generating lots of chips in a big CNC machine, uh, it gets, gets the chips out of there. Uh, so it needs to be non-volatile. It needs to not boil away from heat. Uh, you should, should be non-toxic because people are going to be around this stuff. Uh, it shouldn't foam. Otherwise, uh, your machine is going to look like the inside of a washing machine at some point, which is not, you don't want it to foam and, and fill the, the machine up. Uh, high flushing temperature. Too. Uh, so if you've been around a machine shop, they all smell the same. They all smell like the same, the coolant that's used in machine shops. Kind of kind of funny. You can tell tell a machinist by by their smell, and it, it's the smell of coolant. Uh, so there's a lot more pros than cons for for using cutting fluid. Uh, reduces temperature, which makes your tools last longer. It lubricates, which makes your tools last longer. Uh, higher cutting speed, so you can cut faster, so you can increase productivity. You're going to get better surface finish. You're not going to get built up edges. Uh, machine tool power is reduced from the lubrication. Uh, you reduce corrosion. Uh, these all have to be, so you see water-based coolants, it might be 95% water. But the 5% other stuff that's in there is enough that it will prevent the machine from corroding, which also prevents your tooling and your part from corroding. Uh, flushes chips away. That can be a big thing when you're making a lot of chips. This stuff breaks down over time usually and has to be replaced. The organic coolant will uh, start to rot and get smelly, really smelly, and get really gross and have to be replaced. Uh, there's some synthetic coolants that will last a long time and don't get smelly, uh, but eventually will get contaminated and have to be replaced. Uh, and then you've got to figure out what you're going to do with 50 gallons of used coolant. Uh, Shop logistics, yeah, it, this is non-trivial. Uh, so you know, if you try to take something like a regular engine lathe and put coolant on it, uh, you got to keep the coolant in the lathe. And you, know, you usually can't put an enclosure all the way around it. So you're talking about putting a little bit of a bed underneath the lathe and you don't catch all the coolant. It gets on the floor, it gets on the walls. When the, when the spindle's spinning, it slings coolant everywhere, it covers the machinist in coolant, which is why they smell like coolant. And it's it's kind of a giant pain in the ass and it, it's there's so many advantages you usually want to run coolant on any machine you have uh, but it, it's not trivial how you how you manage it uh, machine complexity goes up you know on CNC machines it's usually built in you usually most CNC machines at least the ones you want to buy they're fully enclosed they're sealed up enough that the coolant doesn't get out uh, they've got a recycling system for the coolant. They've got holding tanks that hold it and keep it out of the machine when, when it's not being used. Uh, they'll have uh, skimmers on them to skim crap out of the coolant. They'll have filters to keep chips from recirculating. Uh, and they just manage coolant a lot better than usually than manual machines where it's open and you've got one coolant pump and a coolant nozzle and a, a little bed and a recirculating pump. So usually on CNC machines, this is managed a lot, a lot better. But any machine like a manual Miller lathe where you've got to be up there working, you can't just enclose the whole thing. So unfortunately, I can't show these videos oh, I need to pause it, uh, because they're on YouTube. And I know I can't show YouTube video on YouTube. There's a copyright issue there. So I'll post links to these videos. Uh, there's some other fancier kinds of coolant, you know, cryogenic cooling for doing some titanium machining, really specialized stuff. Uh, it's the same thing like with, with cooling PCs. Most PCs are going to be air cooled. You might use water cooling and some crazy people out there are using liquid nitrogen to cool their PCs. But yeah, it works, but it's pretty, pretty rare. Uh, again, cryogenic cooling, I mean, you, you might see that in some niche applications, but it's pretty, pretty rare. So, uh, flood coolant, very common. Almost all CNC machining, you'll, you'll see some form of flood coolant. There's some things like red brass that machine so well that you just don't really need coolant. Uh, you know, some aluminum you can get by without it. But in, in general, you want to use coolant if you can. It just makes pretty well everything better once you have the infrastructure in place. Uh, deciding on tooling. So this is a very complicated little, little function model here. Uh, but you've got all of your inputs from your process. You've got your material, uh, what kind of cutting you're going to do, roughing versus finishing, your part geometry, uh, how rigid you're going to be able to hold the part, which means, you know, it determines how aggressive you can cut, uh, whether you're making one or making a lot, 
Uh, so when you're making one part, you mainly want to, you don't want to break your tooling uh, and you don't want to scrap your part. So you usually be a lot more conservative with, with your tooling and your feeds and speeds. Uh, mass production, it's all about getting every bit of life out of, out of the tool. So if you think about something like an end mill, uh, if in mass production, you really want to cut almost along the entire cutting edge length of an end mill. So you wear that entire length of the end mill. You don't just want to, to wear the bottom quarter inch of the end mill. So, you know, with the tooling geometry you use might be a lot different when you're talking about mass production. You're really trying to get every bit out of each tool before you replace it. You really don't want to be breaking tools in mass production. You want to be getting them replacing them at a specific point when they've worn and you want to be able to predict when they're worn and replace them before it starts affecting tolerances. So I do almost exclusively small batch manufacturing when I do stuff for design teams or student projects and so the you know, decisions I use for making tooling are going to be a lot different than somebody that's trying to machine a thousand cylinder heads in a day. Uh, past experience, right? A lot of this comes from just experience and doing it. Uh, your manufacturing process continuous versus interrupted uh, so interrupted cutting is very bad on very hard on tooling and very hard on machines and so you need to be very careful with interrupted cutting versus continuous cutting but sometimes you have to do interrupted cutting and sometimes you're turning something that's a square shape and you want to turn it round and that's the option you've got is interrupted cutting so uh, there's some tooling that's designed to be better for that it, it handles the impacts better uh, finish requirements work holding rigidity, how much time you've got to machine. Uh, at the end of this, you're going to have the tooling you pick, your speeds and feeds, your depth of cut, your cutting fluid, right? These are the things you're going to be tweaking on the output of it. Uh, so in general, some uh, trends in these parameters. Going from, uh, again, high speed steel is where you should really start. As you get into these more exotic materials, they get less tough. Their hot hardness increases. Their impact strength goes down because their toughness goes down. Their wear resistance increases. Because their toughness goes down, their resistance to chipping goes down. Uh, your cutting speeds go up and your depth of cut goes down. Except again, this, this just don't even consider it. But start with high speed steel. You can take pretty aggressive cuts and cut slow maybe. Uh, you know, here over here you're going to be taking usually fairly light cutting passes. And I don't know why it says heavy. You usually decrease your depth of cut when you go to harder materials and you push your speed up. Uh, surface finish is going to go up as the material gets harder. Uh, method of manufacturing gets more complicated as it gets harder. Uh, the fabrication options, like you can machine high speed steel. You know, you can't really machine carbides very well. Uh, so you can grind, you can polish, you, but your, your options get limited and it gets more expensive. Thermal shock resistance goes up. Uh, tool material cost goes up. It gets more expensive. So uh, at the end of the day, there's going to be a complicated diagram here, but essentially your total cost per piece is going to be the sum of different things. Uh, your machining cost, your tooling cost, the tool change cost, and your non-productive cost, you know, your materials that go into each part. So, uh, you know, materials that go into each part are going to be the same regardless of how how, how you're machining it. Uh, cost of machining per piece as you cut faster, there's less time, so you're, those costs go down. Tool changing, uh, as you go faster, you're going to be changing tools more often. Uh, as you go faster, you need more expensive tooling, and so the cost of that increases. And you sum all these costs up, there's going to be a sweet spot for the what you're trying to do in your shop. Again, this changes a lot when you're doing one-off stuff. Like if you ask uh, Randall Lewis, who runs the, the manufacturing lab for this, this course, you know, what his, his thoughts are on speeds and feeds and acceptable versus not acceptable feeds and speeds on, on machining and CNC machines, you're going to get a lot different answers from him than you will from somebody that's an industry machinist that's making 1,000 parts a day or 10,000 parts a day because uh, you know Randall needs to keep his machines alive and keep his tooling intact and make his you know the parts he's making and the volume he's making correctly uh, so his values are different from somebody that needs to make a thousand of something as fast as possible for as cheap as possible uh, they're, just, they're different they're different values so that these curves are going to be different for, for different different operations and different different uh, industries so uh, changes quite quite a lot so uh, that's it for tooling uh, so 
it's about time for this lecture today anyway, so uh, I will sign off for today. Uh, I will post the, the quiz is posted, uh, so make sure you get on the quiz. It's due Sunday at midnight, so thanks, everybody.